just breathe. <laughs> Slow row Chicago. My name is Obai, Obai Reed. I am the president of the Slow Row Chicago movement. And my name is Stephen Vance, um, formerly of Streets Block Chicago, which is probably how you and I met a couple yes. years ago. But then uh, I'm now helping Obai with a project here at Half Night um, that a lot of you have worked on. I think there's like now 13 people that have contributed their help. Uh, let's go. Cool. So first I want to talk about sort of uh, the history of Slow Roll. Slow Roll is a global movement. It was founded in Detroit in 2010 by two people, Jason Hall, this gentleman here, and another gentleman by the name of Mike McCool. When it started, it was just a couple of people who wanted to ride on a weekly basis. And over a few weeks, over a few months, it grew and grew. And it eventually got up to a few hundred. Um, and then about a year ago in Detroit, something caught and it just took off. And it went from a few hundred to a few thousand, riding on a weekly basis. And that's important because we don't know of any other weekly rides that happen in the United States with numbers like that. You'll see an annual ride that'll get a few thousand You'll see a monthly ride, like a critical mass, every once in a while, you know, gets, gets thousands of people. A weekly ride, though, getting thousands of people to come out on a regular basis is, uh, is unheard of in this, in this country. So what I, what, the other thing that makes that so important is because it's Detroit. It's Detroit. With all of the challenges that Detroit has, nobody anticipated that Detroit would lead the way in terms of how to use biking to create community. It was always, you know, West Coast City, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle. Well, like a rose growing through concrete, Detroit gave birth to a, a movement that, you know, people around the world are now paying attention to, including us in Chicago. And because of that, we, my co-founder Jamal is here, <laughs> Uh, we saw what Detroit was doing, and we wanted to bring the same energy and spirit to Chicago. And in order to make that happen, we had to create, you know, some type of structure because it's just him and I, we're unpaid. We don't get paid for this work. We love this work. We're passionate about this work. So we, we created a structure that we felt like would allow us to achieve our objectives. Uh, we created a nonprofit organization and uh, created a board of directors. Uh, we have ride leaders who help us lead rides, and we have a volunteer team called Squad Chicago who help us manage our rides while we're riding, the uh, safety and logistics of each ride. And then we have an extensive volunteer community. Uh, many people here <laughs> have been volunteering for Slow Road Chicago and helping us with this data project that we're going to talk about tonight. Yep. Uh, the mission, the mission of our organization is to connect a diverse group of people to utilize the activity of cycling to transform neighborhoods. The values that we hold dear, there's three that we really want to focus on tonight. One is inclusion. You know, what we ask ourselves is, why are black people, why are brown people, why are low to moderate income people in Chicago feeling disconnected from the activity of cycling? And part of why that is, is because we don't feel included in the conversation. We don't feel included in the activities. And a priority for us is creating an environment where everybody feels safe, everybody feels protected, everybody feels like their culture is represented and everybody feels a part of our community. Diversity. One, you know, as, as, uh, as black people, we like to express ourselves. We like to express ourselves in what we wear. We like to express ourselves in the way we communicate. We like to express ourselves in the, in the music that we listen to. And part of 
creating a culture, an environment where people of color and low and moderate income people feel comfortable riding bikes is creating an environment where they can express themselves. And this is an example of expressing ourselves through the bikes that we ride. And that's ultimately what we're talking about when we talk about diversity. Equity. Equity is about, it's, it's, it's completely contrary to the city's approach to bicycle infrastructure. The city's approach to bicycle infrastructure is the communities who bike the most deserve the most infrastructure. That's not equity. Our position is equity is about the communities who bike the least deserve the most infrastructure. And the reason that's important to us is because we want the communities who bike the least to one day be at parity with the communities who bike the most. And the way that we get there is by investing more in communities that bike the least so that they can grow to where communities are that bike the most. So in other words, ridership in Inglewood is very low. Ridership in Wicker Park is high. In order to bring Inglewood up to par with Wicker Park, we have to invest more in Inglewood right now than we do in Wicker Park. That's true equity. Equity is about creating parity and doing the investment, doing the work so that you achieve parity. So, you know, why do we do all of this? There's so many benefits to biking. And Stephen is going to talk about some of those social factors. We believe our society is better the more people bike. And we want our communities to be better. We want to improve the condition of our communities. We want our communities to be just as bikeable on the south side and west side as north side and downtown. And creating a diverse bicycle culture in Chicago is part of improving our society. Creating equity around bike, bike culture in Chicago is a part of that. And ultimately, we believe we will transform our neighborhoods as a result. Uh, some of you may, have, may know my story. I've been uh, pretty public about uh, how biking saved my life. I've struggled with depression since I was uh, in high school. And I went through a very hard time in my life where I, you know, considered some very drastic ways to, uh, to, to you know, end myself of the pain that I was experiencing. And as an adult, I wasn't riding bikes. I had an old bike in the basement that I hadn't rode in years. And as a last resort, I decided to take the bike to the lakefront and just see what happens. Will it help? I don't know. I'll try it, though. And that ride on the lakefront is part of why I'm here today. I turned to biking and it was like medicine for me. And I want other people, especially people of color, especially low to moderate income, low to moderate income people in this, in this city who feel excluded, who are struggling with mental illness, who are struggling with poverty, uh, struggling with all types of challenges to find value in riding bikes and experience the healing that could come from that type of experience. So that's sort of my, you know, personal testimony. Um, and part of, you know, what I recognize through riding as an adult is that I was able to, you know, engage in a community. I remember that, that ride on the lakefront, it was so interesting to me because at, at one point I just wanted to sort of acknowledge the other people that were riding on the lake and I would look up and say hello or a head nod and I would get it right back. And I just thought that was awesome. I felt connected. I felt a part of this community that was riding on the lakefront that early morning. Um, and, and part of it is expanding our worldview. This city is uh, incredibly segregated. Um, we want to show people different parts of this city. We want to take people off the block, out of their neighborhood, and show them all that this city has to offer. And then lastly is to create some interactions that, that may at first be a little bit uncomfortable because you're talking with people that you don't normally talk to in terms of age and race and income and class. But those diversities, that diversity of interaction for me is what helps us grow, what helps us improve the condition of our society. 
And how do we bring the mission to life? We have three primary tools that we use. Our signature ride. So Solo Chicago, similar to Detroit, we're going to ride every Wednesday night in Chicago. That's our signature ride series. We're also going to do some weekend rides on, on Saturday uh, when we start our season in April. Those signature rides are always community-based. They're always in partnership with a community-based organization, and we work very deliberately to get people to ride with us who don't ride right now. That's our target audience. We want people to consider riding who don't ride. Uh, we do programs, so we do community engagement work. Uh, one example of a program that we, uh, we do now is community engagement for Big Marsh to connect. Big Marsh is a huge bicycle park that's being built on the far south side, far southeast side of Chicago. And our work with that park is to help people in Pullman and around the neighborhood to feel connected to this park. Because what we're fighting against is people from around the world traveling to Chicago, traveling to the South Side, traveling to Big Marsh Park, bypassing Pullman, and people right there in the neighborhood don't feel connected, don't feel a sense of ownership, don't feel engaged with Big Marsh. So that's one of the programs that we're implementing. And then the last part of our uh, process of bringing our mission to life is advocacy. Advocacy for us is about pushing the city, pushing the state to make equity a priority in Chicago. District of <coughs> Stephen will talk about this. We're focused on bicycle infrastructure in Chicago being equitably distributed. If there's one thing I really like doing, it's pushing the buttons at the people of the people who work in city government. <laughs> um, anyone who's helped us so far, please stand up. I want to get like a full count of of who's. So Eric, Martin, Adam, Gino, Bonnie. I think yeah, Bonnie, you're in that picture. <laughs> um, and I think we have several more who are not here tonight, but thank you for helping us get this far. We're going to show off what we've worked on. Um, so we've had to collect a lot of data. So we're trying to build a, a tool to, to prove. So Obai has the hypothesis that the city has one way of looking at equity and distributing bike lanes, but there is another way. And we're building a tool that can like measure those different ways, measure the city's way and measure what we think is a better way. And right now I'm calling it the bicycle equity index. Um, so to get to the point where we got today, we've got a map, like it's all it does. All it does is it shows things on a map. Um, we had to collect a lot of data. And so that's what we did for like the first two or three weeks. Um, we collected way more data than the map actually shows because it's kind of a, you have to, like debate what kind of data you want to show on the map, especially for the first time you've got to show it. Um, this is one of us. This is the first meeting, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Obai, like we've known each other for a couple of years. Um, More than that. You wanted, you wanted this tool to be built. Yes. And I said, well, you can't just show up at half night and say, someone <laughs> build my tool. <laughs> <laughs> And so I told him, you got to like come here and get to know people. Well, yeah. that's exactly what you do, what you did, and you're really good at that. And I wasn't there because I had mono at the time for four <laughs> weeks straight. <laughs> but you did that, thankfully, and you got the ball rolling and so that when I came in, you would already like assemble the team. Um, so I guess I should have shown the map first. Let's do that. And then I'll get back to that slide. Like, like I said, it's really just like two things. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what you're looking at is population density as the base layer. So the redder, the more dense uh, the census tract is in Chicago. And then it's overlaid with bike lanes. And there are two colors going on here. Darker green is a protected bike lane or a off street trail like the Lakefront Trail. And they're darker green, so they come out more as these are the safer, the, the likelier 
They are more likely to be a safe route because they are separated from car traffic more than other kinds of bike lanes, which are then highlighted in the lighter green. And so you can see uh, the distribution of those uh, as well as like how much progress we've made because before 2011, there were no other dark green lines except for the major Taylor Trail here, the Burnham Greenway over there, and the Lakefront Trail. So all the other dark green lines have been installed in the past four years. Um, so now I'm going to bring back this slide. Okay, so we that took a lot of work just to put that map together because it's like us volunteering on Tuesday nights. Uh, and a bunch of people worked at home or during their own jobs, <laughs> which is great. But then, like, whatever, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'll let them uh, debate with themselves if that was appropriate or not. Uh, so, uh, to build the tool, I'm going to need more help. And so, like, we're going to keep acting today as well. And I'm going to have to, we're going to have to talk about how we organize ourselves and organize the next several months. Uh, I've got the two groups up there. I think one group is going to be an analytical group because we have to look at these social factors and how bicycling is affected by them and affects them. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's been a lot of research, uh, academic research uh, that we're going to have to start synthesizing. And then the other group is going to actually like do the programming and the map making. Um, and part of that, I want to start teaching some skills because, like, oh, by, I could make this tool like all by myself, but that would be the worst idea because I wouldn't have a life anymore. Right. And it would be all everything that I want it to be. And that, that like, as much as that makes sense for a single, whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm not used to working in groups so much, which is why we got, I think, to spend a lot of time organizing ourselves. Uh, and so I want to teach GitHub, like you said, Martin. I want to teach Leaflet, HTML, JavaScript. I want to bring people up to, to a, a, like a common base level to show how this map got made and how we're going to make it better. And then also, which is the really hard part, and that's building the, the index itself. So I imagine it that you click on any point in this map, and it tells you the index. And that helps you understand the difference between this part of Chicago and another part of Chicago. <coughs> so you would preferably click on two points if you were trying to investigate the difference between neighborhoods. Um, and there's going to be a lot more, because Obai is, is pretty set on his, uh, his approach, of uh, which started with a letter to the city asking them to basically prove that they were being equitable in their distribution. And I doubt we're going to get a response. Uh, so this is our response to them. Um, and I think it would, it would work well in other cities. Um, what was that? Yeah, the OSM data. That's a very well. The, I think finding the data that takes a long time, it's really not that hard. It just takes a long time to put it together in the format we need. Um, the only difference in the, in the data between cities would be the locations of bike lanes and the, and these, and the things that uh, represent these social factors. So I guess I should go over those. So I said bicycle can, there's research on how bicycling can affect these social factors and how these social factors affect bicycling. So reducing violence. And like I can't really talk through any of these because I haven't read the research myself. That's why we got to bring on more people. <coughs> um, decreasing health care disparities. I think that one, I think you can surmise for yourself with how that bicycling affects health. Um, attracting strong retail. That's where most of the research has been recently. How like uh, after a bike lane was installed in a corridor that never had it, the, the retail sales uh, improved a little bit, and uh, one thing that I love hearing from these studies is that business owners overestimate how many people arrive by car, and they'll 
like there'll be a before survey and like the business owners are like, oh, I'm pretty sure like 80% of my customers come in a car. It's really at that in a lot of uh, where these cities have come in. I mean, where these studies have been done in these cities. Chicago hasn't really been a focus of any of these studies. And I think maybe our, our tool can help change that. Uh, and then increasing job creation. Again, I'm not so familiar with that. Definitely need your help. Um, so yes, we'll be hacking afterwards in the cafeteria. Uh, if you saw the map and you're like, oh God, I can do better than that, uh, please <laughs> help us do better. You got any last words? No, we can open it up for questions. Okay. Of course. Yeah, I mean, so you got all, you showed us this map, you got a whole audience here, like, what are your questions for us? Like, what is the feedback that you guys are looking for? Uh, is a bicycle equity index, as I described it, the right way to measure the distribution of bike lanes in the city? But, I mean, so, is it, I mean, so there's a lot of different ways. It seems like is this, that seems like it's a kind of tactical question, right? So, okay, the policy aspect is that the city has a bike 2015 plan. This is 2015. It should all be done by the end of the year. Okay. <laughs> it was uh, approved by the city council in 2006. It has two overarching goals. One is to decrease the number of injuries and fatalities by 50% from 2006 levels. The second is to increase the number of trips under five miles that are taken by bike to 5% from whatever the level it was, um, it's between one and two currently. So I don't know how we're gonna get to five by the end of the year. So it's, but the city is, a, we make a lot of plans here. Uh, and so after this one it expires, I think we'll probably end up making another one. Uh, and I wanna be ready for that policy also, or inform that policy with perhaps better uh, goal making. Because at that time in 2006, they didn't know the answer, or they didn't know the baseline data for either of those goals. So that didn't make sense to make goals that you couldn't actually measure. No, I mean, I think it's. I mean, you should talk to. I don't have. A, I don't have the deep insight that's going to let you know which tactically the better framing for you. But an alternative framing that you might consider is instead of a bike equity index, a bike opportunity index, right? Because most of the stuff here. It's not about firm distribution, it's about like what positive things would happen if uh, if you put in bike lanes. And in general, people are oftentimes much more maybe feel like about equity. This is not a great thing, but people like about equity, they think about like they put them in a frame of thinking about a zero sum zero a, a zero sum game. And they're like, okay, well that means I want less for over here and over there. But if you talk about opportunity. It can oftentimes put people in a more uh, friendly frame of mind, and they're saying like, "Okay, what if like this is a growth orientation as opposed to uh, a redistribution framework?" We we've actually talked about that. Um, Eric actually suggested that we, as a part of the bike equity index, we look at what happens in a neighborhood when ridership numbers increase. Right. So they sort of try to, you know, forecast, does retail increase, does violence decrease, does, you know, health disparities decrease, those types of things. So that's an excellent suggestion, uh, and it's a part of what we're exploring with the equity index. Jackie? Um, so for a bullet point, I would probably change that slightly to financial impact, not just job creation, but job accessibility. Um, as well as the overall impact of like having an inexpensive form of transit where there are often neighbors that are not well served by buses and CTA in general. Sure. Steve? Yeah, your, bike, your, uh, your map showed uh, bike lanes over de uh, population density. I think a stronger statement would be to uh, put some financial data in there, uh, economic, um, economic health of the neighborhoods and see where the bike lanes have been built in relation to the economics, or maybe take some other factors like uh, literacy or, um, you know, 
racial distribution, yeah. I mean, you look at census data, you can find any sort of, you can do any sort of cross tabulation that you desire, but you're trying to illustrate a very obvious point. Yeah. Illustrate it. Go for it. Yeah. You said one of your goals was to be able to click on the map and show the index. Yeah. Uh, is that or that opportunity point. index or other, yeah, some other measurement? Is, measure is. is that at any point on that chart, or are you going to zone it in a way? I'm not from here, so I don't know how the zones in Chicago work, but in Seattle, we have districts and budgets that are allocated, votes uh, or petitions that are proposed are all based on the districts. Right. And so when you go back to the city and you say, hey, this zone uh, really needs attention. We do have city council districts, and everything we do will be able to be sorted or filtered by that district. Okay. Uh, because another part of the policy problem is that the city, so you described it, the city installs bike lanes where people are already biking. It also installs bike lanes where the city councilor agrees to let it be installed. And so in many cases, the, the alderman doesn't agree, and so the bike lane doesn't get installed. So this tool could be used as a way for people who live in that district to come back to the alderman and insert themselves into that conversation. Uh, so there's like groups like uh, CMAP and Action Transportation Alliance and um, Center for Neighborhood Technology. They all care about bike infrastructure. It's one of the things that we thought about. Why haven't they done this already? Or why haven't they, or are you, are you just proposing a completely different way of, of thinking about it that you may have? You know, just <laughs> launched like this week, this so called opportunity index. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I haven't looked at it yet, but of course, when you said opportunity, I'm like, oh, right, so that kind of is doing they love making indexes. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's yeah. the point of their existence. Yeah, there's a bike level of service index on that page, too. Right, so. And it's on the data books. <laughs> So you're going to walk us through it <laughs> in 20 minutes. <laughs> it seems like maybe there's people who could help you do that, that sort of opportunity right. or speculation or whatever. Uh, that, you know, this is what they do. They do your partnership potentially. Uh, back there, the purple shirt. Yes, I saw on the web that the Chicago Department of Transportation in 2009, they did a study. They put out these pneumatic tires that measure bike traffic and not yes. vehicle traffic at 26 points in the city. Um, and they, they did collect, and it was, the data was reported in the report in 2011, and it said it was supposed to be annual. I don't know if they did it. Yeah, the city has a bike count program that it conducts. Uh, very few times a year in very few locations, and I wouldn't find it reliable for anything because of how infrequently it occurs. And it's like four hours a day, 16 times a year. Yeah, but it did show an equity from the south side and the north side. So. Right, they distribute it geographically, but not necessarily equitably. So that's often their thing is like if we divide the city into three parts, south, west, and north, do we have an equal number of bike lanes in each? Per person currently riding. Right, but it seems to be that But I don't even think it goes that far. <laughs> what did you say? The data supports the points you're trying to make. Right, and it's an issue of collecting all that and rewriting it so it's understandable in a simple tool. And I would invite you to come with us. Maybe one more question. Uh, Hi, I, I think the rides sound really great. And I wondered how you can build more on the enthusiasm of those rides, too. Because that's a big testament if you of uh, the interest and the energy, the more you get these groups involved, you know, beyond the pictures are great, like a picture of the group, but I wonder if there are more ways that you can, like you say you partner with organizations, mm -hmm. or if there's a way to say, you know, 50 people or profiles or anything to like make your point that you're 
training yeah. on the other. Yeah. And also, how did Detroit do that? They must have yeah. publicized it somehow, or eventually you just see a thousand people going past every right. weekend. So. Right, and you want to join in. Yeah. So this is something that we think very deeply about because, again, our target audience is people who don't ride. So how do we inspire them to look at bikes in a brand new way? The pictures and videos is an important part of that. Connecting with people in a very personal, emotional way is a very important part of that. That uh, you know, getting them to you know see bike in a brand new way. Um, we're exploring every avenue to engage with people who think that bikes is something that white people do, or something that or kids do, do. Yeah. or something that poor people do because they ha can't afford a car. Or people with spandex. Spandex <laughs> people <laughs> could ride them in their cars. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and you know, let's not underestimate the power of working with community-based organizations. Yeah. You know, because they're in these communities. They're working with people. They're already organizing groups. Yes, yes. So when we get there for a ride, because we've been working with them, you know, for months, in some cases, to plan a ride, and there's community engagement, there's, you know, participation in the planning process, you have a, a level of, uh, of ownership in our rides that uh, is very important for people to feel included in the process. How do you get Ron down there? Uh, that picture? Yeah. Well, that was, we went to uh, an announcement that the governor and uh, the mayor were both that. They did an announcement for Lake Calumet, announcing public access to Lake Calumet near Pullman. And uh, a few of us, about 10 of us came riding up on our bicycles to this announcement and all these people walking around with suits and ties on and you know, all dressed up and they see you know, a diverse group of people riding on bicycles. And I think Rob just looked at us and said, what the heck is going on? And they had to come and talk to us. <laughs> talk to us because the governor came and talked to us. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, you know, if I could add, you know, it is a very transformative experience and there have been a lot of people that have come from a lot of uh, different areas as far as uh, Deerfield and uh, Lake Forest and, uh, and have ridden with us. And so, you know, what we've done is we've started, you know, actually creating a huge community by connecting people from various communities. We're bringing a lot of folks into neighborhoods. Some, uh, we had people that had never, hadn't been back to Roseland and they grew up in Roseland, but they hadn't been there in 40 years. And to come back to the neighborhood and see that, you know, I can still ride through the neighborhood that I grew up in and uh, and I don't need a bulletproof vehicle. And a flat <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I can actually patronize some establishments in this neighborhood so I can get off the expressway and feel safe, you know. So it is a very transformative experience for those that come from other areas, and they see that you know the narrative that's projected in the media is a false narrative, and there are some wonderful, beautiful areas in the city of Chicago that I never see because I believe in this false narrative. You know, excuse me. <laughs> All right, well, that was awesome. I think maybe we'll take the more questions into the breakout group, but thank you again, Steve.